A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 5th of August 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion. See today we are going to discuss five articles in detail and two articles I had given as reference so that you will be able to recall those topics again and again. Okay. Also, we have prelims practice question and quiz question and one mains question for your practice. Okay. Without wasting much time, let's get into the first news article discussion. See this article here. It says that high inflation is driving about 8% of the current surge in the goods and services tax revenues that is GST revenues. And as per the article GST collections have clogged over 1.4 lakh crore for 5 successive months. And the reason stated for this higher GST revenue collection includes compliance, economic recovery and higher inflation. The revenue after adjusting the inflation factor is also high and as per the article it is because of the increase in the consumption rate after COVID and this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context let us understand about the inflation and how GST revenue increases because of this inflation. Okay. First of all let us see about inflation. See, inflation is the rate of increase in prices of goods and services over a given period of time. Inflation is typically a broad measure such as the overall increase in prices or the increase in the cost of living in a country. But it can also be more narrowly calculated. For example, it can be calculated for certain goods such as food or for services such as haircut. In such cases, it is narrowed down, right? See, this inflation can also be translated as the declining purchasing power of consumers and it decreases the value of money. For example, let us say in the year 2015, a person is buying a commodity at rupees 100 and after 5 years, that is at the year 2020, the person is buying the same commodity at rupees 200. Then the price increase here is rupees 100. Am I right? So this means that with rupees 100, you cannot buy the same commodity after 5 years. Why is this occurring? This is because of inflation. See, due to inflation, price rise has happened. And due to this, the purchasing power of the consumer has decreased. Think about it. If the person has rupees 200 in the year 2015, then he can buy two commodities. But after five years, he can only buy one with rupees 200. And this is what meant by decreased purchasing power. Okay. That is with more money, you can buy only less quantity of goods or services. Okay. Now let us see the relation between inflation rate and GST revenue collection. See, the article that we saw today said that GST revenue has increased to many factors. The first one is tightening of compliance by government which has led to lower tax evasion. The other one is economic recovery which led to higher consumption rate. And the final one is inflation. Now you may wonder how inflation will increase the GST revenue collection. See the domestic inflation that is the increase in the retail and wholesale prices of goods and services has led to the increase in the revenue. Think about it. Let us say the price of a commodity in the market now is rupees 10,000 and after some time due to inflation the price has increased to rupees 20,000. Now here we are going to do a small calculation. Let us say the GST rate is 16%. Then the central GST rate that is CGST is 8% and state GST is 8%. Here we are not going to discuss the split in the revenue. We are just going to take 16% as whole. Now for 10,000 when you apply 16% GST, how much do you have to pay as tax? Yes, it is 1,600. Am I right? Now let us calculate for rupees 20,000. 
For twenty thousand, when you calculate, you have to pay a GST of rupees three thousand two hundred. What has happened here? The amount we pay as tax has increased due to inflation. So this is what is given in the article also. So I hope you understood the relation between inflation and increase in GST revenue. See when the prices of goods and services are increased then the amount of the tax that will be paid as tax will also be increased am i right and that is exactly why inflation has led to higher gst revenue collection okay so that's all about this news article see if you just know what is inflation you are ready for your preliminary examination but when you start linking what are all the impacts the inflation is causing you will be able to handle any type of mains oriented question see today we took an opportunity to link inflation and gst revenue collection am i right so whenever inflation is increasing gst revenue collection is also increasing we saw with certain examples how it is occurring okay so like this whenever you get an opportunity to learn economic topics first of all understand the concept then take the concept to the next level by knowing how it is caused and what are all the impacts it is causing okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article here it says that mr panni selvam has given a representation to the chief justice with a plea to transfer his civil suit to some other judge earlier justice krishnan ramasamy of madras high court handled this civil case and he said that Panni Selvam can appeal the judgment legally but cannot give representations to change the judge because then everyone will start to follow it and this is the crux of the article given here in this context let us understand about the functions of the high court see first of all know that high court has extensive and effective powers and it is the highest court of appeal in the state However the constitution does not contain detailed provisions regarding the jurisdiction and powers of a high court it only lays down that the jurisdiction and powers of a high court are to be the same as immediately before the commencement of the constitution but it added one provision which was not there in the pre constitutional era that is the constitution gives the high court jurisdiction over revenue matters One more important thing is that constitution empowers the parliament and the state legislature to change the jurisdiction and powers of a high court okay here you have to be clear about one thing the parliament and the state legislature cannot cut the powers and jurisdiction of the high court as guaranteed by the constitution okay at present if you take high court enjoys original jurisdiction writ jurisdiction appellate jurisdiction supervisory jurisdiction control over subordinate courts then a court of record then the power of judicial review is also enjoyed by the high court see when you take the original jurisdiction it includes matters of admiralty will marriage divorce company laws and contempt of courts then it includes disputes relating to the election of members of parliament and state legislatures then it includes matters regarding the revenue or an act ordered or done in revenue collection then it also includes enforcement of fundamental rights of citizens then cases ordered to be transferred from a subordinate court involving the interpretation of the constitution of its own file so now these are the things that comes under the original jurisdiction of the high court Next comes the writ jurisdiction. See Article Two Twenty Six of the Constitution empowers the High Court to issue writs, which includes habeas corpus, mandamus, certiorari, prohibition, and cure warranto for the enforcement of the fundamental rights of the citizens and for any other purpose. Here, if you take the term for any other purpose, it refers to the enforcement of an ordinary legal right. So this means that. the jurisdiction of the high court is wider than supreme court this is because the supreme court can issue writs only for the enforcement of fundamental rights and one more important thing is that the high court can issue writs to any person authority and government not only within its territorial jurisdiction but also outside its territorial jurisdiction provided the cause of action arises within its territorial jurisdiction understood So after knowing about all of this 
we can come to the conclusion that rig jurisdiction of the high court under article 226 is concurrent with the rig jurisdiction of the supreme court under article 32 it means that when the fundamental rights of a citizen are violated then they have the option of moving either to the high court or to the supreme court directly okay now coming to the appellate jurisdiction see a high court is primarily a court of appeal it hears appeals against the judgments of subordinate courts functioning in its territorial jurisdiction okay see it has appellate jurisdiction in both civil and criminal matters hence the appellate jurisdiction of a high court is wider than its original jurisdiction okay see i have given in detail about the appeals regarding civil matters and criminal matters just go through it that is enough okay next comes the supervisory jurisdiction a high court has the power of superintendence over all courts and tribunals functioning in its territorial jurisdiction the exception for this includes military courts okay see this power of superintendence of a high court is very broad because it extends to all courts and tribunals whether they are subject to the appellate jurisdiction of the high court or not and the power is broad because it covers not only administrative superintendence but also judicial superintendence understood and the next power is the control over subordinate courts see high court has an administrative control over the subordinate courts let us see some examples regarding this it is consulted by the governor in the matter of appointment posting and promotion of district judges and in the appointments of persons to the judicial services of the state then if you take it deals with the matters of posting promotion grant of leave transfers and discipline of the members of the judicial services of the state then take another example it can withdraw a case pending in the subordinate court if it involves a substantial question of law that require the interpretation of the constitution finally let me end up with one more example its law is binding on all subordinate courts functioning within its territorial jurisdiction in the same sense as the law declared by the supreme court as binding on all courts in india okay now let us see its power as court of record see as a court of record a high court has two powers firstly the judgments proceedings and acts of the high court are recorded for perpetual memory and testimony these records have evidentiary value and cannot be questioned when produced before any subordinate court they are recognized as legal precedents and legal references and additionally it has power to punish for contempt of court now finally as a court of record a high court also has a power to review and correct its own judgment or order or decision okay but the important thing to be noted here is that no specific power of review is conferred on high court by the constitution on the other hand if you take the supreme court it has been conferred with the powers of review by the constitution itself okay at last let us see about the power of the judicial review of the high court see judicial review is nothing but the power of a high court to examine the constitutionality of legislative enactments and executive orders of both the central and state governments so if high court found that any law is violative of the constitution then they can be declared as illegal unconstitutional and invalid by the high court and consequently they cannot be enforced by the government now you have to note one thing here the words judicial review are not used in the constitution but the provisions of article 13 and 226 explicitly confer the power of judicial review on a high court okay so that's all regarding this news article see in this news article we covered about the powers and functions of high court and we decoded each and every powers so that whatever question is put up in your preliminary examination you can handle with this information alone okay and here for the main aspirants it will be very much useful if you know the powers and functions of high court and if you are asked to compare it to the supreme court or any subordinate courts you can directly use these points so whenever you take any body may it be constitutional body or unconstitutional body you must know that these are the functions and you must know to decode each and every function so as to remember and use it for your mains examination okay
don't just stop with the listing down of functions if you just list down the functions it will be useful only for your preliminary perspective not for your mains perspective okay so these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this editorial article in this editorial article the author looks back at the jammu and kashmir 3 years ago why because on the same day before 3 years in the year 2019 the status of jammu and kashmir was changed forever through a legislation which is the jammu and kashmir reorganization act of 2019 see lot of reasons were cited by the central government at that time for this move mainly to attain certain goals in the region including bringing democracy in the jammu and kashmir region so author of this editorial has analyzed whether the goals have been achieved and did the region attain democracy or not we'll discuss all these points with the help of data and statistics before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference just go through it okay now let's start a discussion first let us briefly understand what changes were brought in by the jammu and kashmir reorganization act On 5th August 2019 this legislation put an end to the statehood of Jammu and Kashmir it split the state and demoted it into two union territories namely union territory of Ladakh and union territory of Jammu and Kashmir Jammu and Kashmir has legislative assembly but Ladakh is a union territory without a legislative assembly okay along with the legislation two resolutions were passed they withdrew the special status of jammu and kashmir under article 370 and article 35a of indian constitution one of the major reasons for this move was the prevailing internal security situation in the erstwhile state which was worsening due to the cross border terrorism okay so this is the background you need to know Now come to the goals and promises made as a part of bifurcation. First goal was eradicating militancy, terrorism and improving the security in the region. Let us see the data regarding this. In Jammu and Kashmir, it was found that the number of civilians killed between 2019 and 2021 was higher than the 5 years of 2014 to 2019. around 177 civilians were killed in the 5 years but as many as 87 civilians have been killed in just 2 years between 2019 and 2021 they were killed as a result of cross firing and terrorist violence you can see the data for 2 years here 2019 and 2020 this shows that security situation has not improved but at the same time we cannot deny the fact that the incidence of militancy and terrorism has declined a bit in this data you can see the estimated net infiltration and terrorist incidents during last 4 years there is a significant decline in terrorist incidents this is partly because the security grid in the region has been strengthened okay So less security incidents have resulted in decline in the killing of security personnel also 99 security personnel were killed from August 2019 to November 2021 but the situation is worsening since the beginning of 2022 killing have started increasing okay see militants are targeting the kashmiri pandits elected officials of local government that is the panchis and the police This is mainly attributed to hybrid militancy. See hybrid militancy is also called as faceless militancy or anonymous militancy. They are the militants who are not listed as ultras that is they will not be known to the civilians police or armed force as militants. But they are those individuals who have been radicalized enough to carry out a terror strike. so they suddenly surface in some terror violence and then slip back into the routine life according to an estimation more than 430 youth have joined insurgency between 2019 and 2021 the main issue with countering this militancy is there will not be any evidence of that person being involved in the militant activities 
every time the security forces will be finding new faces so this makes it difficult to charge them and turn them as terrorists or militants generally counter insurgency operations can be successful in eliminating militancy when they know the militant leadership that is knowing who is involved but this aspect is totally useless in case of hybrid militancy so the conclusion is the security goal is not achieved at all but improvements could be seen therefore the need is to further enhance security measures like putting in place a better security and intelligence grid this is to prevent terrorist attack then day and night round the clock checking patrolling and proactive operation against terrorists etc etc have to be carried out so that's it about the first goal let us take up the next goal which is integrating the region with the indian economy and attaining prosperity say like any other region pandemic and lockdowns affected jammu and kashmir also but it was further affected due to the security lockdowns in the states that was imposed when the article 370 was abrogated author has noted the comments of niti ayog regarding jammu and kashmir it was a top performing state but last year it has been ranked among the bottom also many industries are facing loss in the region such as the fruit industry manufacturing carpet and handicrafts industries tourism played a major role in its economy but pandemic and security concerns have affected this also so overall economy of jammu and kashmir region did not prosper what is needed is returning of tourists to boost the tourism sector and schemes to develop the loss making industries are very much needed okay so that's it about the second goal the third goal was bringing back the kashmiri pandits see you would have heard about the plight of kashmiri pandits they are the hindu kashmiris who lived in the kashmiri valley in 1990 they were subjected to target killings and attacks by the terrorists the terrorists compelled them to convert with the slogan ralav talav yaga liv it means convert leave kashmir or perish So fearing ambush and attack many Kashmiri pundits left the Kashmiri valley some data suggests that 650 Kashmiri pundits were killed and more than 75000 of them fled Kashmir in Jan 1990 and 70000 followed till March 1990 so bringing them back was one of the goals of the government but it seems this goal will not materialize as once again attacks against Kashmiri pundits have started so this goal has also been defeated so that's it about the third goal now look at the fourth goal the fourth goal was to bring a new era of non dynastic politics see dynastic politics means a series of politicians and rulers coming from the same family for instance in jammu and kashmir abdullahs are said to be the first political dynasty they have remained in politics for over 80 years through the party called national conference its founder was sheikh mohammed abdullah so one of the goals of the center was to end this dynastic politics and enable non dynastic politics this was to be done through bringing new political leadership in panchayat ranks but again this goal is failing because as i already said the panchis that is the leaders of panchayats are targeted by militants or terrorist so this goal is also not fulfilled now finally let me come to the last goal of attaining democracy in the region and extending the rights and benefits of indian democracy to the people of the region to know whether democracy is attained we need to understand what is democracy see when we say democracy the first point that comes to the mind is in this form of government rulers are elected by the people democracy has several features first the final decision making power must rest with those elected by the people next a democracy must be based on a free and fair election where those currently in power have a fair chance of losing also in a democracy each adult citizen must have one vote and each vote must have one value finally a democratic government should rule within the limits set by constitutional law and citizens rights when these features are present 
we call it as a democratic state mainly democracy is preferred as it is more accountable form of government and it improves the quality of decision making itself so with this understanding of democracy can you say whether jnk or jammu and kashmir region achieved democracy or not the answer is democracy has not been achieved why because the region was first under president's rule and then lieutenant governor's rule Legislative assembly elections have not yet happened even though delimitation exercises has been completed just now we saw in a democracy the leaders are elected by the people and for that free and fair elections are needed but both did not happen in the jammu and kashmir region this is why author contends that the promise of democracy seems far away so to achieve this goal assembly elections need to be held immediately and the conclusion is Central government did not achieve the intended goals in the Jammu and Kashmir region. It has a long way to go. So that's all about this news article. In this news article, we saw about the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganisation Act goals. See, during the reorganisation, the government quoted certain goals. So the author of this news article discussed each and every goals and how far these goals have been achieved or not achieved. and not only that we substantiated each and everything with the current data okay so this is the way in your main answer you have to support your points with the statistics or any other data which is much government oriented data okay now if you ask what are all the key takeaway points that you can use it for your mains and prelims in this jammu and kashmir reorganization act year and how it is reorganized and it is reorganized into two union territories one with assembly and one is without legislative assembly so all these information no you can utilize it for your prelims examination when you take to mains examination you might be question like what is the effect of this reorganization act and what is achieved in these 3 years after the reorganization was made so for these no you can utilize the points that we are discussed today okay See this is a very important question regarding mains that is why we took this and decoded it in a detailed manner okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article here it says that seasons of armula vallasadya a unique ritualistic feast attached to the onam festivities has started on thursday it is said that the crew of seven snake boats that is palliyodam reached the temple guards As per the tradition, the crew were presented the betel leaves, arica nut, and tobacco, and escorted to the temple premises. The oarsmen circumambulated the temple, singing "Vanchi Pattu," which includes the verses in praise of Lord Krishna. And this is about the news article given here. In this context, let us revise about the Onam festival. See, Onam is the state festival of Kerala. It is mainly a harvest festival. but it also celebrates the homecoming of mighty asura king mahabali see here his homecoming from patala is celebrated as per the malayalam calendar onam is celebrated on the day of thiruvonam nakshatram in the month of chingam which is the first month of malayalam calendar see when you take in the english calendar it is celebrated in the month of september See the 10 day harvest festival begins on attam first day of onam and concludes on thiruvonam which is the last day. So now let us see the history and the significance of this colorful festival. See according to Hindu mythology King Mahabali was known to be generous and kind despite being a demon. His reign is regarded as the golden era in Kerala and that's exactly why his return is widely celebrated. According to the Vaishnava mythology it is said that Mahabali came to power by defeating the gods and taking over three worlds so gods were unhappy with this and asked for lord vishnu's help in a battle against the demon king mahabali but vishnu did not want to participate in a battle as mahabali was his devotee instead to help other gods he took the form of poor dwarf brahman popularly known as Vamana avatar and he visited Mahabali the brahman requested the property right over a piece of land that measures 3 paces and Mahabali agreed to this agreement 
The dwarf suddenly grew in size and covered everything Mahabali ruled over in just two steps. For the third step, no, Mahabali offered his own head. But impressed by Mahabali's devotion and good deeds, Vishnu allowed him to return to earth once a year. It is this annual visit that is celebrated as Onam. Like I said before, it is also a rice harvest festival. See, the preparations no, start 10 days ahead of the three prominent days. People make flower mats known as poo kolam in their courtyards, then elaborate feasts, dancers, flowers, boards and elephants are part of this colourful and vibrant festival of Onam. A prominent feature of Onam is the Vallamkali, which is the snake boat race. Grand fees are prepared on this occasion, which is known as Onasadhya. It comprises 13 dishes. The food is served on the banana leaves and commonly consists of rice along with different dishes, pickles and puppets. See, as I said, the Onam celebration include Vallamkali, which is the boat race, then Pulikali, Pukolam, Onatappan, then Onamkali, Tug of War, Tumbi Tullal, Kummatti Kalli, then Onathallu, Onavillu, Kachakulla, Onaputtan, etc. etc. See, note that Onam is the newer day of Malayali Hindus. Okay? That's all about this news article. We came to know about the Onam festival which is the state festival of Kerala. See, you may ask why we need to learn about a state festival. See, look at this festival as a whole. See, it is bringing several communities of people under one umbrella. See, you can quote this kind of festival in your main answer where you get a question which is based on unity in diversity. Though we are diversified through communities, we are united in this kind of festivals. Okay. Especially when you take the boat race, no? Several communities of people come together and participate in that festival or in that race. Okay. And when you take this discussion in prelims perspective, you just want to know that Onam is a state festival of Kerala. And as I said, there are several celebrations, right? Those words are also something that is related to Onam, which is related to Kerala. So this much information will be enough for your preliminary preparation. But when you take in mains perspective, you can elaborately utilize this as an example to quote unity in diversity. Okay. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. This news article from Chennai edition notes about an important fort in Tamil Nadu that holds significance in the South Indian history. It is the Jinji Fort. As per the news, the fort has not got the recognition it deserves. So, currently the district administration is working with the Department of Tourism and the Archaeological Survey of India to put forth on the tourism map. Okay. So, let us know few facts about it from exam perspective. See, it is also known as the Senji Fort. It is a fort built in the small town of Jinji or Senji in the Vilupuram district of Tamil Nadu. It was once a capital city for most dynasties of South India. It was under the possession of several empires such as the Vijayanagara Nayaks, Marathas, Mughals, Nawabs, the French and the British. So, it has witnessed numerous invasions, warfare and bravery. And a witness of the rise and fall of the successive empires across the centuries have been witnessed in this area. See, it is said that around 1280, Jinji was fortified by Ananda Khon. Ananda Khon was the chief of the local shepherd community and was part of Khon dynasty. But some sources also mention that the fort in Jinji was built by the Chola dynasty in the 13th century. See, the Jinji fort complex has many components. It has massive fortification walls. These walls interconnect the three inaccessible hills, namely Krishnagiri, Chandragiri and Rajagiri. These hills form a rough triangle. There also exists a smaller hill in the vicinity known as the Chakali Duk. The complex is encompassed by a large rampart which is almost 60 feet wide. Rampart means the length of a wall that forms part of the defensive boundary of a castle. Okay. 
See the rampart encloses an area of about 11 square kilometers which is known as the lower fort. The lower fort area also contains structures such as temples, mosques, pillared halls and tanks. Also know that the three hills contain individual citadels along with several other structures. They form impregnable citadels or fortress. Among the three, the Rajagiri citadel is the highest one. It is about 800 feet in height. It houses a Kalyana Mahal which is the most impressive multi-storied building with a pyramidal roof. It is regarded as an architectural jewel. Overall, the fort is lauded as one of the most impregnable fortresses of peninsular India. Due to the historical as well as military importance of the fort, Jinji is known as the Troy of the East because Troy is the most powerful kingdom as per ancient Greek literature. Okay, so that's all about this news article. In this news article, we saw about the Jinji fort or the Senji fort which is located in the Vilupuram district of Tamil Nadu. See, though this is a factual based discussion, you can utilize the points that we discussed in this in your mains answers wherein you get questions from art and culture waste okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article here see this article is talking about a poxo case see we are not going to discuss this topic in detail today because already radha lakshmi ma'am has dealt with this poxo act in a detailed manner in our hindu news analysis see i am just giving you the link so that you will be able to revise this topic and for aspirants who had already gone through this topic there will not be a wastage of time for you okay and those who are not gone through the topic just click the link and go through it once okay now have a look at this news article see this news article is talking about the monsoon in kodagu district see there was no reply from the incessant rains in the mysuru mandya belt on thursday so this is about the news article and is clearly talking about the monsoon am i right so taking this as an opportunity let us go through the monsoon topic in detail today let me not waste your time in discussing about this topic which was already discussed by keetana ma'am in detail see regarding this monsoon whatever you have to know in preliminary perspective she has discussed in a detailed manner see in order to ease your preparation the link for this discussion is displayed here just click the link and go through the discussion and know about this monsoon in detail Okay, so with these two articles, let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice question discussion. This is regarding the transfer of cases. Here only two statements are given. So whenever two statement question comes, you have to go through both the statements before arriving at the answer. Now look at statement one. See, statement one is incorrect because as per article 139A of the constitution, it is said that the Supreme Court may transfer any case, appeal or other proceedings pending before any high court to any other high court if it deems to do so for the ends of justice. Okay. So the transfer of cases can be done is the correct statement. Since cannot is given in the statement, statement 1 is incorrect. Now look at statement 2. It is also incorrect. See, if cases involving the same questions of law are pending before the Supreme Court and one or more high courts or before two or more high courts, then the Supreme Court may withdraw the case pending before high court or the high courts and dispose all the cases itself. And after this, the Supreme Court may return the withdrawn case to the respective high court and the high court shall proceed to dispose of the case in conformity with the Supreme Court's judgment. Okay. This is done in three circumstances. First is if the Supreme Court is satisfied on its own motion that the case is needed to be withdrawn or based on an application made by the Attorney General of India or it can be done by a party to the case. So, in all these three circumstances, the Supreme Court can transfer the cases from the High Court. Okay. So, now what is the answer for this question? Since the question is demanding for correct statement, the answer for this question is neither one nor two. Now, look at this third question. See, the third question is regarding the Senji Fort. 
Now let me read out the question for you. The Senji fort was under the possession of which of the following empires? Here five empires is given. One is Vijayanagara Empire, Marathas, then Mughals, then Nawabs, and British. See the answer here will be option D. One, two, three, four, and five. That is all of them. Okay. Now let me explain you why. See around thousand two hundred A.D. Jinji was fortified by Ananda Kun. Then in thousand two hundred forty A.D. the northern hill of the city was fortified by Krishna Kun. Krishna Kun is a successor of Ananda Kun. After the Kuns, then it came under the Chola Empire. So some sources also mention that the fort in Jinji was built by the Chola dynasty in the thirteenth century. Then in the 16th century, the Jinji became the seat of the Nayaka rulers. Nayaka rulers were under the lordship of Vijayanagara Empire. Krishna Devaraya of Vijayanagara Empire appointed Krishna Panayakas as the chief of Jinji. Thus, Krishna Panayaka is considered the founder of the Nayaka line of Jinji. So it was under Vijayanagar Nayaks. Note that most of the structures in the city, fortification walls, and temples were built during this period. But in 1677 A.D., Jinji was captured by the great Maratha ruler Chhatrapati Shivaji. Under his rule, fortifications and defences were further strengthened in Jinji. Then in 1691 A.D., Jinji came under the hegemony of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. In this period. Sarup Singh was appointed as the chief of Jinji and Jinji was kept under the control of the Nawab of Arcot but Sarup Singh's son Raja Day Singh revolted against the Nawab of Arcot this resulted in a war where Raja Day Singh was defeated and killed so Jinji became a part of Nawabs in the year 1714 AD He noted that Raja Day Singh's courage became a legend, and his heroic deeds were sung in the form of popular ballads. This is the reason why Jinji became quite well known to many. Then, in 1750 A.D., Jinji came under the French rule, but was surrendered to the British in 1761. And again, in 1780 to 99 C.E. Jinji came under the control of Tipu Sultan and at the end of the third Anglo-Mysore war in 1799 Jinji was recaptured by the English and remained in their possession thereafter okay so we had discussed about the leftover facts about the Jinji fort via this question okay so the answer for this question is option D all the above that is it was under the possession of all the five okay See displayed here is a quiz question for you go through the question it is a pair based one so try finding answer for this question and post your answers in the comment section the correct answer will be posted in the comment section itself within 24 hours and displayed here is a mains practice question for you see go through the question and try attempting to write answer for this question it will be very much useful for improving your writing skills for mains examination okay so with this We have come to the end of the discussion. If you like this video, do like, share, and comment, and don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar Ayes Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.